when it comes to the fight against insurance companies, large corporations, and the healthcare industry, injured victims are always the underdog. But that doesn't worry us. At Messon Associates, we're an injury law firm from Philadelphia, and we come to fight. Our clients know that they've got representation with a chip on its shoulder, and it's the same chip that makes Philly the toughest city in the country. Call 215-568-3500 or visit us online at messalaw.com. Messa & Associates, the toughest injury firm in Philadelphia. G-L-E-S Eagles Eagles fans, welcome back to another edition of Football 24-7. I'm your guy, Tone DeShills II, and I'm joined by none other than our Philadelphia Eagles insider, John McMullen. Make sure you guys smash that like button. Make sure you guys are subscribed to the Jacob Sports YouTube channel. You guys always know you can catch John McMullen on Burge 365, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. And also, you guys can definitely check John out here on Football 247. He does an amazing job covering the Eagles on SI.com. That's SportsIllustrated.com. And also, JacobSports.com. That's J-A-K-I-B Sports.com. John, how are you feeling, my friend? Uh, great. Yeah. We're talking before. No, uh, no snow. I'm excited about that. Looked like it might be a little bit snowy uh, at MetLife Stadium. Uh, not going to be the case. So excited about that part of it. You know, it, it, it got me thinking now, John. Um, you're a pretty laid back guy, a, a, pr- a pretty objective guy. What 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 gets John excited these days? Um, you know what makes John feel spectacular uh, home game. these days? <laughs> yeah, this is this is the uh, people get mad at me because I don't root for the Eagles. I don't, you know, I think there's been a big change in journalism over the years. But um, I'm rooting for the Eagles this week, and I'm rooting for the Washington Commanders, not for the reason everybody else is, but because I want <laughs> I want a home playoff game. Yeah. I don't want to have to go on the road. So, you know, everybody's got their rooting interest. That's my rooting interest. Stay at home. Wait, so help me out with this, right? You know, we talked about this, I think, last time we spoke. You're from the Jersey, you know, Pennsylvania area, right? Yeah. So Jersey, uh, born, uh, moved, uh, uh, didn't live here about for about 15 years and came back and, uh, yeah. So, uh. so help me understand, right? Obviously, you're a journalist, and we and we love your, you know, uh, how object how, how how objective you are these days, right? We appreciate that in Philadelphia. But growing up, where did your rooting interest lie, or did you come out the womb as an as, as an objective? No, uh, Julius Irving and Reggie Jackson. That's where my uh, loyalties as a youth were. So I was a big Sixers guy growing up, Julius Irving era, uh, big Yankees guy growing up, Reggie Jackson era. Okay. Um, and yeah, when you cover sports for as long as I have, um, you tend to get uh, objective because, you know, the old saying is never meet your heroes. I think mm. people would be disappointed if they got to meet their heroes a lot of the time. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's 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 not hard. And and you can see it, by the way. I've seen people cover the Eagles who were big Eagles fans, and as they continue to do it, 
you can see it getting beaten out of them because it's a job mm. like anything else. So, um, but yeah, um, so it's not it's not as fun as people imagine it to be. Mm, the life and times of a journalist covering the NFL. So, John, you know, let's get into it, right? You know, um, as the the tagline at the bottom says, too many too many distractions heading into Week 18. Um, I want to get your thoughts on this, right? Um, I don't think you and I have had an opportunity to really pick each other's pick each other's brains about, um, you know, AJ Brown finally speaking to you guys. I think that was that was Wednesday, wasn't it? Yes, Wednesday. <clears throat> hey, after you and I spoke, it would happen like that. So, Wednesday comes, AJ Brown decides to speak to you guys, and he pretty much. Tells all and shares all. Well, shares as much as he probably probably is allowed to share. But I want to pick your brain about what was your instant reaction? What were some of your instant instant thoughts and feelings uh, regarding A.J. Brown, what he had to say to you guys, and I guess the aftermath of what he said as well? Well, my biggest takeaway was the Seattle game and the improv, as he called it, between him and Jalen Hurts, which, uh, you know, we all talked about it after that particular game. And Nick Sirianni had that convoluted, weird explanation as to what went on on that particular play. Right. Drawing pass interference, whatever. We're all looking at him like, what are you, what are you nuts? <laughs> but uh, turns out he was just protecting the players. So. From that standpoint, you say, hey, you know, that's pretty good. And A.J. came out and essentially said, you know, thanked him for it and explained that um, it, it was the players sort of. But I, I also think because my concern was they were going rogue, so to speak. They were improv, I think, is a, is a weird term to use. Uh, freelancing is not a good term. Uh, basically was just a normal check within the offense. Um, so that part of it's not that bad. Part of it, though, you go back, you almost do a 180 on that play because if you looked at it on film, you say, all right, corner's about 12 yards off. So even if you're thinking about that, you probably kill it right there because you're not going to get a go route on a guy who's 12 yards off. Um, and then Jalen didn't look off the safety Julian Love long enough which enabled him to get back. So sort of do a 180 and say it was just bad, poor execution. Um, and, yes, yeah, good stuff from Nick because he explained the situation. Uh, what I always say all the time, I don't care what you think. You're not judging play calling. You're judging play results. That's what he said. You know, I think it, it's it's ironic in that particular game because Seattle won the game on the same sentiment. Go route. Jackson, Smith, and Jigba against James Bradbury, um, well executed, essentially won the game on the same thought. Um, one's executed well, one's not. It's one a bad play call, one's a good play call. It's the same damn thing. Same damn thing. So you're judging results, and that's what Nick said today. Everybody says it, but and I get it. And everybody knows it, and he knows it. He said, look, we all know it's a results-driven business, but just because something doesn't work, and for some reason this is really difficult for people to understand, just because something doesn't work doesn't mean it's a bad decision. Mm. You know, you, you can make a good decision and get a bad result. But the whole point of... NFL coaches is stack good decisions. The more good decisions, the more good results you'll get. You occasionally can make a bad decision, get a good result. But if you can't, if you keep doing making bad decision, bad decision, bad decision, the odds are going to eventually turn on you. So that's the whole point of it. But for people that say, oh, third 19 bubble screen, um, Bad play call, you know, if they hit a block, you know, um, and maybe the better example was the second down play that lost four yards because A.J. brought that one up against Arizona. You get one block there, that's a – I might go for a touchdown. That might go 
25, 30 yards, miss block, and bang, you lose four yards. Is that a bad decision or bad execution? Let me ask you this, right, because um, obviously they have the Giants this weekend. The, the unfortunate reality is we haven't really talked much about the Giants. Um, it's, a, it's a week 18 game. It's the final game of the season. Some teams are sitting guys. Um, I doubt the Eagles sit guys because of the nature of how everything's set up with, with the Cowboys and the Commanders. But, you know, as far as A.J. Brown and everything that's been going on this week, another thing that he said stood out that stood out to me was the fact that, you know, listen, when things go wrong, the coaches aren't the ones out there playing. That's us. You know, you know, we, you know, we wear the pads. We lace it up. We're out there. You know, last time I checked, coaches don't play. So, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, but basically he was saying that, you know, everything that's been going wrong is because we haven't been doing our job. So I don't know how much I buy into that in full, but here, but but here, here's here's how I'm processing that, right? Let's just say for the sake of argument, okay, I buy into what he's saying. Yeah, yes, the players have not lived up to their part of the bargain, they've not been executing. The question then becomes why? Why aren't you executing? And then <clears throat> and then also, if you aren't executing, I would imagine coaches are addressing this in the meetings and and uh, you know in the, the film room, things like that, right? Yet you're st yet we're in week seventeen going into week eighteen, you still lack luster execute lack luster ex execution. So that begs the question: Are you not are you guys not responding to what the coaches are teaching or trying to correct? Are you guys saying you know bunk the coaches and we're going to do what we want? I mean, are you guys going to continue to freelance? I'm having a hard time understanding how you know AJ is drawing the line there with. Okay, yeah, it's it's all our fault, and I'm like, okay, well, if that's the case, then who's, <clears throat> holding, who's holding who accountable? Because, that, and, I, and I think that's what's confusing for me. Well, it's not a, a zero sum game. It's not, you know, obviously coaches and are there to service the players and uh, to get the players up to speed to get them to where the whole goal of coaching is to get a little bit more out of someone that potentially they could do on their own. And it's always a sliding scale with players like AJ Brown, who's a tremendous player versus, you know, maybe the 53rd guy on the roster. You're always trying to improve each player a little bit uh, and get them to where they were, you know, I've never been before. I talked about the defense last year. One of the reasons I'm, uh, you know, out on my own with Jonathan Gannon, that actually there's a lot of Jonathan Gannon fans, but think about how many um, guys had career years last year on defense with the Philadelphia Eagles. You know, that, that, that says something. Um, when you talk about now, I always talk about fan bases in general, not just Philadelphia, but everywhere. I talked about that play. AJ was talking about the second down play that um, lost four yards, missed block. Well, who'd they miss the block on? Buda Baker. It's an all pro player. A lot of times I, I, I tell you, I, I don't think people look at the other side. You know, the other, well, who's on the other side of the line of scrimmage? Uh, they ain't standing still right. to make sure you get your technique and everything down to perfection. Now, you go to the Pro Bowl <clears throat> this week. All five Eagles offensive linemen are either Pro Bowlers or Pro Bowl alternates for the second straight season. Overall, are they doing a bad job? No. No. Do they miss blocks occasionally? Of course. Yeah. Because they're playing against good players. Um, But overall, because of the group and how good they are, you generally come out on top. But that doesn't mean in the micro sense, one particular play, Buda Baker made a play. Sometimes you tip your cap to a good player on the other side, um, or sometimes you don't. If you don't believe the other side is out there, or the other side is trying, or the other side exists. Um, you know, the Eagles are in position to finish with 12 wins. That's pretty good. Yeah. Top 10 offense, that's pretty good. In most um, important categories, the defense we know has struggled. Um, but, yeah, I mean, now 
I think AJ should have used a better word. I try to get Nick to clear that up today because labels mean things to people. And when you say the word freelance or improvisation or improv, it has a negative connotation. Yeah, especially in sports. Yes. If you use the proper term, check, audible, it's not as bad. Right. Audibles are part of what quarterbacks do in the NFL. Checks are part of what they do. And that was a check to a play that was poorly executed by the quarterback. To be yeah, honest. because, you know, Sirianni even said today when he was asked, um, you know, he was asked, I think, I, I forget who asked the question, but they asked how much freedom does Hurts have at the line of scrimmage. And, uh, you know, Sirianni was like, he has free reign to do whatever he wants out there. Yeah, I, I I think he was overstating that a little bit, but he's got. I think, I think, I think so too. But go ahead. But, but but he's got plenty of freedom, and and he exercised it on that particular play. And again, if it works, everything's copacetic. It worked in Kansas City, the same check. Um, but you got to execute it. So 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 why haven't they been able to execute? At the level they execute, and again, years are very different and very independent from each other. You know, opponent, you know, quality of opponent or difficulty of opponent, circumstances, injury. There's a lot of that goes into it. But on the offensive side, they've been pretty healthy for the most part. Um, pretty much the same personnel, albeit schedule has gotten more difficult. And yes, they are still numerically a top ten offense. But I think the eye test would say, and clearly the team feels the same way. They aren't they aren't executing at the same level or close to the same level as they were last year. And I guess my question for you is at this point in the season, week 18, going into the playoffs, execution needs to be at an all-time high. Why do you believe the team believes the execution has not been up to par? with previous well with the previous season or just with their best performances why do you think the team feels that way well i think you know it's a whole bunch of things i mean they're not even close to what they were last year defensively um offensively they're stunningly close from a numbers perspective um the only difference being turnovers which is a big difference i mean they're Negative seven as we go into week 17, underwater 23rd in the NFL. Last season, I think they were third, and and for a vast majority of the season, they were number one. They finished number three in turnover ratio. So right there, if you take away those turnovers, you probably have a better offense um, than you have the year prior. Uh, So I don't – I think that's – I I think that's overblown on the offensive side of the ball. You have AJ's at 1,400, over 1,400 yards. He might set the record, um, the franchise record, beat his own franchise record. Um, DeMonte's over um, 1,000 yards again. Um, DeAndre Swift is over 1,000 yards uh, for the first time in his career. The Eagles, again, have a Pro Bowl running back for the second straight season, even though they're different. Um, it's the same damn offense. It really so, do you is. think? So, do you think it's strictly the turnovers that's been holding this team back? Do you think it's strictly yeah. the quarterback position? Well, no, because he's not responsible for all the turnovers. But you know, he's got more turnovers than he had last year, and he's near the top of the league in turnovers. Now, part yes. of it, I always say, you got to look at each turnover. The Jets interception—that's on Jalen Hurts. The mm-hmm. uh, the Seahawks interception, we now know that's on Jalen Hurts. Yeah, I mean, you're I mean, ultimately he has I, I always try to give him a bit of throw him a little bit of bail. There are a portion of his interceptions that are very fluky, right? Um, a guy uh, a tip ball at the line of scrimmage or a tip ball off of a receiver's hands or a helmet, whatever it may be. Happens and, to every quarterback. Right. You know, right, but just in particular about Jalen Hurts, I feel like a lot of his turnovers at least interceptions, they've come at the line of scrimmage because of a tip. And I'm curious, do you believe that he's he's somewhat regressed when it comes to 
um, creating the passing lanes. You know, typically, typically in the pocket, you know, quarterbacks, you know, they advise you to, you know, take a step here, take a step here. Just, just a, a, a gentle movement can create a whole passing lane for you. You know, what you know, the more experienced you are. Do you think he's been <clears> a little <throat> bit jumpy in the pocket and hasn't really been cre creating those passing lanes that we're used to seeing? Um, I think he's still a work in progress when it comes okay. to, I, I think he flushes way too quickly, um, up often, um, and he needs to, um, you know, climb the pocket instead of immediately trying to get outside and manipulate the pocket. So I think that's fair, but you know, 14 interceptions, he had, I think six last season, um, the fumbles on top of it, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever he is, fumbles. But understand fumbles, I mean, there's two that stick out in my mind. Because when you have a fumble at the best point, it's always given to the quarterback, right. no matter if it's their fault or not. So one time he had a fumble that was um, his fault, um, and a lot of people crapped on Kenny Gainwell, but it was Jalen's fault. Um, there was one with DeAndre Swift that was DeAndre's fault. And right. They're all put on Jalen's record. Um, you have these seasons, you know, I went through this with Dak Prescott. I was telling people, I would tell Jody, look at Dak Prescott's career. He's very ball security conscious, never had a ton of turnovers. He had a bad year in 2022. I said, it's probably going to go back to normal in 2023. And it did. And I feel the same way about Jalen Hurts. Look at his numbers in 2021 and 2022. Very ball security conscious player. It's probably going to go back to normal next season. I would agree with that. There's 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 a little randomness to turnovers. Now, certain ones, you know, the Jets one being the most egregious again. Seattle one's pretty bad. Um, there's some that are bad, but you can't throw the ball. He's a career high, whatever he is, 500 and something attempts this year. If you throw the football 500 plus times, you're going to get intercepted. I of mean, course. I don't know what people expect. No, um, you know, for me, I, I look at interceptions, right? I don't believe all interceptions. I don't think all turnovers in general are created equal, right? You know, I don't think the game is just as simple as, oh, 18 turnovers, he's a turnover machine. I don't know if it's that simple just to look at, right? Because even with a guy like um, like, like Dak Prescott last season, I, when I saw some of those turnovers, me being objective, I said to myself, I can't blame him for all those turnovers. As a matter of fact, most of them I can't no, blame on. But most and, people look at, the, look at the number at the end of the season and go, oh. Yeah, yeah and, then, and then, you know, same thing with like Josh Allen. I know that's kind of his MO for his career, but, you know, I see Josh Allen in like – some the re, what makes people look at him sideways because some of his a lot of his turnovers come on come in his own territory <laughs> they lead to points you know but he's so talented he can overcome it most of the time but yeah i mean i've said i i think josh is a little bit too reckless but yeah. you know you don't you don't want to he's also you know a great player i i think he's the toughest player to deal with in the nfl when he's you know got his a game going but agreed yeah if you're a coach, you're you're probably saying, if boy, if you could just turn down that recklessness a little bit and still be the same kind of playmaker. But if he does, maybe he's not the same kind of playmaker. So it's a it's a give and take. Yeah, same thing that'll make you laugh can make you cry, right? Um, you know, I wanna I wanna run some numbers by you, right? And I wanna just get your thoughts on this. You know, since we're talking about what we're talking about here, so. I want to give you Jalen Hurts' numbers on the season. Um, 522 attempts, 345 completions. And this is, again, through 16 games played. He has another one left to play. But 522 attempts, 345 completions, 66% completion percentage, just over there, just over 3,800 passing yards, 23 passing touchdowns, 14 interceptions. Uh, as far as rushing goes, 155 carries, 601 rushing yards, 15 rushing touchdowns, um, 67 um, first downs via 67 first downs via the rush and 18 turnovers. Now, I'm going to give you another player. I'm not going to tell you who it is. 541 pass attempts, 355 completions, 65% completion percentage, 
just over 3,900 passing yards, 27 passing TDs, um, 90, uh, 96 rush attempts, 457 rushing yards, 15 rushing TDs, uh, 49 uh, first downs via the rush, uh, 19 uh, turnovers on the season. Who am I? Comp- who am I comparing uh, Jalen Hurts to? Well, 15 touchdowns, give it away. That's Josh. That's Josh Allen. Um, it's it's fascinating. Who would have thought Jalen Hurts and Josh Allen essentially are having the same season? Um, both of these guys, you know, I was talking, I was talking to Dan Silio about this earlier, and we were almost in shock. Um, both of these guys together uh account for uh 80 uh 80 touchdowns. Uh, they both uh, they, they account for over a hundred um, first downs via the rush, and that's strictly the rush. Uh, they're both um, they're both around the same amount of attempts on the season, the same completion percentage, around the same yards. Um, they're having such similar seasons. Um, I'm will, I'm willing to argue if both of these guys was able to cut those turnovers in half, they would be the two leading the MVP race. Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, you know, Lamar's going to win the MVP, and deservedly so, and it'll be a two-time MVP. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I I talk, you know, I talk to a bunch of guys when the NFL uh, Network does their top 100 day. It's one of my favorite days in the locker room because I like to go around to talk to guys about who they're picking. Usually they pick a bunch of their teammates, but a, mm. a, a bunch of guys, you know, you know, talk about it and even want some help at times. So it's, it's a fun day, but, um, and nobody takes it that seriously, but it, it's interesting to where you see what players think of players. And I always say, that's why when players are in awe of somebody, I take notice. And for instance, they're in awe of Lamar Jackson. Um, not, you know, Jody and I have the conversation, not Brock Purdy. They're in awe of Lamar Jackson. Um, they're in awe of, of, you know, Christian McCaffrey. They're in awe of back when I covered him, Randy Moss. And the the the, the players, you know, they're like when play, Aaron Donald, when players are like, I remember talking to uh, Brandon Brooks about Aaron Donald and yeah, I was talking to him for my all pro vote and I said, you know, who's the best? Oh, I, I, and I even told him, I said, besides Aaron Donald, who's, who's the best uh, defensive tackle. And he said, nobody's close. Wow. Not even, not, not even Chris Jones, huh? Nope. And well, and, and this is obviously Brandon number of years ago, oh, but, of course. Yeah. but, um, yeah, so there's certain guys, uh, and Lamar is one of them right now. Mm-hmm. Um, Josh Allen's one of them, and Jalen Hurts is one of them, um, to a certain degree. Um, and and you start to take notice, and then there's other guys, and there's nothing wrong with it. Like Brock Purdy's having a phenomenal year. Yeah, but he, he has the most he, yards with the least amount of attempts. Right, he has like the least. Attempts out of all yeah. out of all the starters but, and has like but, some of the most yards. And, and and Jody gets mad at me, but he needs everything around him to be perfect. And that's not an insult. It's you just know, a reality, if, right? Yeah. If he had to go and everybody, it could be Patrick Mahomes on down. Guess what? They're not going to be as good if they're on Carolina. But that's where the vacuum, I would say, this league's not a ba- vacuum. Chris Long was talking about it. Context matters. Your your supporting cast matters. So if you could put everybody on the Carolina Panthers and have them play out 17 games, who would win the most games? Probably, you know, Patrick, Lamar, or or Josh Allen, and everybody else incrementally down. You know, that's that's the only way you can judge, but you can't do that. So you have to have the sliding scale. And all that matters is, are you a fit for your particular team at that particular time? And Brock, Brock Purdy certainly is. But 
um, yeah, you can't put him on other teams and he won't be able to do the same things. You know, a guy like Lamar will be able to do more. Right. He, he just his skill sets is more dynamic. So, yeah. you know, uh, we're about to close the show off, John. Um, we got the Giants coming up, obviously. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have to do some traveling a little bit a little a little bit of an hour and a half drive. I mean, nothing nothing too grand for you, I'm sure. And you know, once you pull up in the Rolls Royce, I'm pretty sure it's a comfortable drive, right? <laughs> so um, you know, this matchup, week 18, uh definitely has repercussions. Um the Eagles are still, believe it or not, in the running for the division, but they're not really in control of their own destiny. Um, knowing all of that, you know, what's your you know, what's some of your um Overall thoughts on this matchup. Your overall thoughts on the situation they're in with the NFC East, and um, how do you, and, and what do you think? What do you think is going to be their approach, um, entering this game during the game, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean they're going to play to win the game, and they're but they're going to do it judiciously. I mentioned earlier today, Devontae wasn't going to play. Uh, Darius uh, Slay isn't going to play. Um, that turned out they already rolled them out, so. You know, anybody who was in that situation, the team's pretty healthy um, as a whole. Um, Jordan Davis um, uh, is going to fight through his ankle injury. Zach Cunningham's going to play. Um, so he's uh, that's big, getting him back. Um, DeAndre Swift had a little bit of an illness, so they listed him as questionable. I assume he'll be healthy enough to play. But – you know, they're going to be scoreboard watching as well. So if Dallas is up, you know, 21 nothing at halftime, you might see Marcus Mariota at that point. But as long as you have a chance to win the NFC East and that number two seed, you got to play. You got to play until, um, until you don't have to play. And that's how the Eagles are going to handle it. Hey, I like that. So uh, you mentioned – uh, Devontae not playing, Darius Slay not playing, uh, DeAndre Swift questionable with illness, but likely to play. Um, it's, it's interesting. This is the first game Devontae will miss for his entire career. He's in, he's already he's already in his third year in the NFL. It's it's funny a guy like that. You know, he came into the NFL. A lot of people looked at him as being this slide of build guy, uh, no meat on his bones. Yeah. Um, a, a lot game. of people were. were, were yeah, a lot of people were really questioning, you know, questioning if this guy could even last. And he's taken some hits throughout his career. And I mean, literally, he's it's, it's some situations where I've questioned if he should have got up from it. Um, yet he's been an Iron Man for the most part. And um, it just so happens he's gonna miss his first game due to a, a fluky injury or a fluky play, man. It's it, it's it's really astounding a guy like that has, has really been able to withstand what he's been dealing with. Yeah, I mean, he he is extremely tough, and, you know, if you saw him after the game, you, you know, we were all concerned that he might be done for the year. He's on crutches. He's in a walking boots. Um, and then two days later, we see him in the locker room, and he's got the walking boot off, and he's got the crutches ditched, um, and he's not even limping. Um and I truly believe that the Eagles were in first place and um, they needed this game to, to lock down the second seed. He'd probably be playing. Can't say that for sure, but probably. I think they're mm -hmm. just being cautious. Certainly with Slay, they're being cautious. Remember, the MetLife Terp is not good. I'm forgiving. Yeah. <laughs> What about uh um, Cunningham? Is is he is he is he a go or is still up in the air? Yeah, he's a go. Um, so he's going to play, and that's a big get back uh, because they've obviously struggled at linebackers. So at least you'll have. So who's Nick who do you, who who would you say are their top two linebackers? Morrow and Cunningham right now? Yeah, yeah, no okay. question. Um, and he missed three games. Um, uh, Zach Cunningham. So getting him back uh, is is big, and certainly for the playoffs as well. Because to me, the playoffs hinge on this defense becoming. It's not going to be good. Uh, that 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 is kind of out the window. But if it can be serviceable, they could probably do some things in the playoffs. So, you know, if Slay and remember if Slay's out there. Ringo and Ricks aren't. Um, if if Cunningham's out there, Shaq Leonard and Ben Van Sumer aren't. 
Um, so that should help the defense. Um, can it be serviceable? I, I don't, that's, that's, that's your hope. And those guys being back for the playoffs, obviously Slay is not going to be back uh, Sunday should help. And on that note, Eagles fans, we're going to end the show. We appreciate you guys for locking in on the content. As always, make sure you smash that like button. Make sure you guys are subscribed to the Jacob Sports YouTube channel. And also, make sure you guys lock in with John McMullen. Uh, he does great work. He does great writing on SI.com. That's sportsillustrated.com. And also does great writing for JacobSports.com. That's J-A-K-I-B Sports.com. And also make sure you guys check him out on Burge 365 with, with his partner in crime, Jody McDonald from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. And also check them out on the pre- and post-game show uh, featuring Seth Joyner, uh, Mike Missinelli, um, our guy Derek Gunn, who's been MIEA as of late, but for, but for good reason, of course. Um, Mark Farzetta, Kayla Santiago, Bill Colarulo. Uh, the team is doing amazing work and we're holding each other down in the best way possible. And we appreciate you guys for always locking in as well. Again, you guys were locked in on football 24-7 with – John McMullen. I'm your guy, Tone DeShields II, and we'll see you next time. Take care. When it comes to the fight against insurance companies, large corporations, and the healthcare industry, injured victims are always the underdog. But that doesn't worry us. At Messon Associates, we're an injury law firm from Philadelphia, and we come to fight. Our clients know that they've got representation with a chip on its shoulder. And it's the same chip that makes Philly the toughest city in the country. Call 215-568-3500 or visit us online at messalaw.com.